give all praises. And God, I ask that that same vision that you gave me and that you're giving in me and you're producing in me, that you would produce that in the hearts right now, whether they're 60 or 12, God, that they would get a vision, Lord, for your beauty and the infinite worth of Christ, that you are coming soon and all of our hope lies in you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Come here. Yes. <laughs> now, Jonathan, you went to another house of prayer in Birmingham, and you did an internship just so the prayer room would be small enough so you could walk all by yourself and not have anybody bump into you and get lost in God. I want you to tell them what God did to you and for your life in one three-week internship where you set your heart apart to engage God in the place of prayer and worship. Uh, what God did in me in Alabama... I went to Birmingham for three and a half weeks. And uh, what he did in me was that not to, not to just go in little three-week spurts or a month spurts of loving Jesus, but to actually encounter him and to actually love him for the rest of my life. And I, I was spending a lot of time in the prayer room, and that was, like, really good for my heart because I had never spent so much time in the prayer room, even though I would grown up in this community. So, yeah, and I was playing worship sets, and so it was really good. So. <laughs> yes. Thank you. All. <laughs> they are just so cute. Just cute. Man, if I was a girl in 17 or 15, I'd like y'all. <laughs> They're like, thanks, Dad. Thanks. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> oh. Well, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, open them up to Revelation chapter 12. I want to talk to you tonight about war in the heavens. War in the heavens. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. You are the mighty one of Jacob, the mighty one of Israel, El Elyon, the Lord Most High, the Lord of hosts, El Sabaoth is your name, Adonai, the supreme, the mighty one, the glorious one who wraps himself in light as a garment, who rides the clouds as his chariot, who treads upon the high places. When you speak, the stars stand in attention and the seas cower at your commands. When you loose your voice, the desert shakes and the cedars are split in two. Who is like you, God? You are glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. Your kingdom shall know no end. You are the Lord. The earth is yours and the fullness thereof and all the inhabitants that dwell therein. There is none like you. There is no other God. You sit above the council of the gods and the circle of the earth. You weigh all men's hearts and you break the power of darkness. All the wicked shall flee before you. We thank you today. We thank you. You are our Savior, our Redeemer, the Mighty One. And we bless your holy name. Come, Lord, help us tonight. Break the power of every working of every devil. Break the power of all darkness upon our hearts, upon our minds, upon our wills, upon our bodies. Release your kingdom in power. We thank you for the victory at Calvary 
We thank you for the cross of Christ and the blood that speaks a better word. We thank you for the resurrection where you destroyed the power of death. We thank you for the ascension where you pour out blessed Holy Spirit and you bring forth the kingdom into the hearts of men and women. Thank you tonight. Thank you. Father, release your power. Release your love in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Well, I've come tonight to announce to you the good news, the good news of the gospel. There is an appointed end to iniquity. There is a day appointed when darkness and the power thereof will be broken and broken forever. Beloved, I have good news for you tonight. It shall not always be this way. I have glorious news tonight, and I come proclaiming what all the prophets and all the apostles have proclaimed since the very beginning. God has appointed a day of reckoning, a day when he will pour out his wrath on everything that hinders love, when Christ himself will split the sky and make all things new. I come tonight to give you good news. Do you believe it? I hope so. Because the greatest transition in human history is coming to a city near you. The greatest upheaval of all the systems of power and the workings of devils is coming to a city near you. For the Bible is promised today when the same man who came, God in the flesh, fully God, fully man, who lived our life, who died our death, who paid our penalty and bore the wrath that was due us, whose very blood became an atoning sacrifice for our sin and whose very blood pleads for our forgiveness. The same one who died on that cross and the same one who rose from the dead and the same one who sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, the Scripture tells us this, He shall come again. And when the seven trumpet sounds and the loud voices in heaven proclaim the kingdoms of this world, they shall become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. The Bible tells us that three glorious sounds will happen on that day. You will hear the Lord of hosts shout. Beloved, what will it be like on that day when Jesus, the King of glory, who has Genesis 1 on his resume, for all things were created by him and through him and for him. He is the image of the invisible God, the very radiance of the Father's glory. One day, very soon, he will shout, and that shout, will cause the heavens to open and the earth to tremble and the seas will quake and the mountains will disappear into the heart of the sea. And then it tells us the second sound will be the sound of the shout of the archangel himself. Oh, beloved. When Jesus shouts on that day, it will send a, a wave of passion through the angelic host and all the resurrected saints, and you will hear the archangel himself shout. Why? Because victory, the day when all things are made new, will happen. And then the third sound will be the last trumpet. And when the last trumpet sounds, that will be the day that the evil one and all of his minions and everything that hindered love is vanquished. Oh, beloved, beloved, hear me. Now, I hope more than three of you are glad about that. I hope so. 
So I don't know about you, but I can't wait for the day that I have my resurrected body and that I have no more temptation, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more crying. When death is destroyed and death no longer has sting and the evil one is bound and the usurper who has deceived the nations is cast into the bottomless pit. Oh, what's it going to be like the day you wake up with no temptation? When every thought you have is a thought of love. Where every motive of your heart is to make someone else more glorious than you. (laughs) And there's a holy competition to see who can make the other shine the most. Oh, we've lived in this sin-stained, demonized world with its world system so long, we don't even know. We can't even imagine what it's going to be like. But I'm here to tell you tonight, the second coming of Christ is not in the realm of Narnia or the Lord of the Rings. It's not a good story to give you moral courage. It's not a little nice bedtime story so you can learn how to be a better person. Oh, it's way better than that. He's a real man who came from a real heaven, who died a real death for you and rose from the dead for you and sits at the right hand of God for you. And one day, very soon, the Bible says, he will come for you. Beloved, turn with me to Revelation 1, very quick. Oh, beloved, we have have relegated this glorious gospel, which is the story of God's kingdom coming to earth as it is in heaven. We've relegated the gospel to just the forgiveness of sins, And we've left the second coming of Christ and the destroying of the evil one to the realm of Narnia. It's not like the Lord of the Rings trilogy. It's not little nice little stories like the Hobbit. It's way, way, way better than that. No wonder the evil one has kept it silent in the church for so long. Why? Because it's the story of when Jesus, the king of glory, the seed of the woman, crushes the head of the serpent. Let me ask you a question. If you were the evil one, which you're not, praise God. And if you are, you have to leave. (laughs) Get out. (laughs) In Jesus' name. (laughs) But if you were the evil one, and the storyline of redemption contained the coming of a great and glorious king who would crush your head, would you seek to remove that chapter out of the book? Oh, yes, you would. Beloved, and he's, he's largely succeeded. Because even though I will declare the second coming of Christ to you, it's still in the realm of a fairy tale or a nice storybook. But it's way better than that. It's a real story. It's your story. And in Revelation 1, we're introduced to the king And he looks a lot different to the Apostle John than he did that day on Calvary. Do you remember at the Lord's Supper that John leaned his head against Jesus' breast? And he leaned his head in intimacy against Jesus. And he was so comfortable with his Lord and his Messiah, his rabbi, his friend, that he even was able to ask him who would betray him. And Jesus told him, he said, the one who dips after me. He's the one. But John's going to see Jesus in a much different way. Why? Because this view of Jesus is not the view of the slain lamb. This is the view of the conquering king whose eyes 
are like a flame of fire. Oh, beloved, do you have a view of that, Jesus? Do you have a view of that one, the conquering one, who's going to make all things right? John said in verse 12, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun, shining in all of its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. He says, John, my beloved, (laughs) my disciple whom I love dearly, you didn't know I could look like this, did you? When I came veiled in humility and meekness, when I came as the Lamb, who was to be slain for the sins of the whole world, and I let you lay your head right on my breast. You had no idea that I was the one who commanded the stars to come into the sky and who laid the foundations of the earth. John, you didn't know I was the one that causes the deer to give birth and says to the oceans, this far, no further. You didn't know I was the one who stretched the heavens like a curtain and holds the seas in the palm of my hand. You didn't know that I was the one that formed you in your mother's womb. All of you. I was the one. The mighty king of glory. The sovereign potentate of the entire universe. And now I've revealed myself to you. Openly displayed. As the mighty one of Jacob, the mighty one of Israel, Yahweh in the flesh. You had no idea, did you, John? And you can see John, he's curled up in the fetal position. (laughs) Have you ever had those times with the fear of the Lord, you just want to dig underneath the carpet and hide? Well, if you haven't, we can pray for you to have one. (laughs) It's terrifying. He's, he's in the fetal position. He's like, oh, because he's in the presence of unveiled glory. Jesus says, John, don't be afraid. <laughs> he said, I, didn't look, I don't look this terrifying because I'm against you. I look this terrifying because I'm for you and I'm against the evil one. <laughs> You see, John, these eyes of fire towards you have a very different impact than these eyes of fire towards the evil one. This sword coming out of my mouth has a very different impact on you, my beloved one, than it has on devils. These feet of bronze, this fiery feet of bronze, this golden sash, this wisdom that I carry, it has a very different impact on you than it's going to have on my opponents, on every person who hinders love. Oh, beloved, the Bible tells us that the greatest transition in human history is coming. A greater conflict of epic proportions and Jesus himself is going to return and take over all the governments of the earth. We're not leaving to go live on some interstellar galactic cloud playing a violin. Jesus is coming to earth and he's going to rule over all the kingdoms. He's going to bring God's kingdom to earth and all things are going to be made new. And it's going to be the most glorious hour. Beloved, I have good news from you tonight. It's closer than it was yesterday. It's coming soon. And the Bible promises that it will surely come. 
And even as we see what's happening on the earth, we understand that the hour's getting closer. Well, I'm here to announce to you tonight what all the prophets and prophets have announced. Turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Turn to God. Repent. 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 Turn. The king's coming. The king's coming, and he's bringing the kingdom. And to all who will call upon his name, he has offered a season of mercy. He has offered a season of grace. He has offered a season of unlimited kindness and multitudes of mercy. He's done what you couldn't. For the Bible says in Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None are righteous, no, not one. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And the chastisement for our peace was put upon him. And by his stripes we are healed and offered forgiveness. Beloved, today there's good news. Not one thing you've done yesterday, today, or tomorrow if you trust and that atoning sacrifice can be held against you. It's atoned for. It's under the blood. Hallelujah. And that season of forgiveness is open. But one day the Bible tells us it will close. And the king who has been veiled in great humility and meekness who came and served us in love and died our death so that we could have everlasting life. That king, that king who was veiled, that king who in his kindness has restrained making all things new. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3 that he's not slow in his coming, that he's not just sitting idly by because he can't do anything. The Bible tells us that he has all power, all authority. But that because of his unlimited patience, because of his tender mercy, he's giving more time. That all would come to repentance. That all would turn to him. That all would repent, which means turn to the God who loves you. Walk away from your sin and come into the kingdom by the blood of Jesus and let your sins be washed clean and demonic strongholds be broken off of your life. Beloved, do you know what joy is? Joy is going to bed with a clean conscience covered by the blood of Jesus. Joy is waking up tomorrow knowing, knowing that you're in the grasp of a loving God whom can, nothing can ever pull you from his hand. Beloved, God has offered a season of forgiveness. But the Bible tells us that one day in the fullness of time that only he knows and that he is appointed, that window of mercy will close and God will finish what he started on the earth. If you'll turn with me to Revelation 12. Revelation 11, verse 15. The seventh trumpet sounds. And loud voices in heaven say, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and then after this announcement of the second coming of Jesus begins and he begins to proceed to remove everything that hinders love and to remove all worldly governments and to set up the kingdom of God on earth and rule over all the nations after this announcement chapter 12 begins It takes us back to an ancient confrontation that began in the garden long ago. Beloved, the Bible tells us 
in Genesis 1, 31, that God created all things in heaven and earth, and he looked upon it all, and he said, it's very good. But somewhere between Genesis 1, 31 and Genesis 3, a rebellion in heaven took place. One of epic proportions where an angel, Satan, Lucifer, rebelled against God and his kingdom and took a third of the angels with him. And he was cast out of heaven. And thus in Genesis chapter 3, it tells us that this deceiver, this rebel, rebellion, how do you say it? This rebellious angel who was cast out of the new Jerusalem, the heavenly temple. In Genesis 3, he came to deceive God's most prized creation. And the tragedy of the human story is that in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve fell victim to that deception. And in that time, death entered the human situation, physical death, spiritual death, and eternal death. The guilt of sin and God's just punishment entered into the human experience. And creation would experience the very groans of sin's impact. That all of human relationships would become distorted and perverse. As men and women used one another and violence would run rampant. Social injustice and political upheaval. As sin would run its course and Satan the usurper would set up his kingdom. And grind and oppress the human race for thousands of years. 1 John 5.19 tells us. That even now, the whole world and all of its systems lies under the sway of the evil one. And in Revelation chapter 12, it brings us back to that ancient confrontation. And it announces to us of how the redeemed, the faithful remnant, is going to partner with God himself in the overcoming of that usurper and that demonic kingdom. And it retells the story of ages past of how Israel labored in pain to give birth to the promised seed. Because in Genesis 3, 3 15, a prophetic promise came forth. After Satan had deceived Eve and Adam, God comes in the garden in the cool of the day. And he calls out from Adam, Adam, where are you? And God finds the tragic news of the fall of his most prized dear creation. He calls Satan forward first, Satan working through the serpent. He calls him forward and he announces the curse and then a prophetic promise is birthed in Genesis 3.15. It's the hope of the whole world. He says to that serpent, you see her? You see that little girl that you deceived? You won round one. But you haven't won the war. Or you see that little girl that you tricked? That you deceived? For out of her loins will come forth a child who will be the king of the nations, God himself in the flesh, and the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. You see her, you won round one, but she wins round two and all the following rounds after that. And the story of the Bible is about, the Old Testament is about a group of people that God picks out. He calls Abraham an Iraqi. Calls him to the promised land. And the whole Old Testament, it's tracking that prophetic promise. Where is that seed going to come? Where is that child going to come? There's a promised king who's going to make everything new. We can't get ourselves out of this predicament. We have no ability. But there's coming a child. And so we find out that through Abraham, and then 
Then we go a little further through Judah. And then through the house of David. Then all the way up to this young maiden named Mary. Till a child is born. And the incarnation takes place. And God in the flesh is ready to do battle against the evil one. And Revelation 12 tells us of that epic battle. And that epic labor that Israel went through to bring forth this precious child. Oh, beloved, aren't you grateful tonight that the nation of Israel for 2,000 years bore the rage of Satan as they held the hope of the seed for, for the redemption of the whole world? How would you like to have the prophetic promise that through your family is going to come forth the Messiah that rules over all the nations and crushes the head of Satan? Do you think you're open to some attacks? Yeah. So tonight, even us as believers, we say thank you to God for the faithful remnant. The faithful remnant of Israel who labored to bring forth the covenants, the scriptures, the prophet, and even Christ, the eternally blessed God. But the story continues. Because just as the faithful remnant had a role to play in the first coming of Christ, verses 6 and following tell us how the faithful remnant are going to have a role to play in the second coming of Christ. And thus, the story really begins for you and I here. The story begins of how God is going to prepare the church to participate with his plans to bring Christ back to the earth to vanquish every opponent of love. How many of you tonight want to be part of that grand story? Well, there's good news. You are. You are part of it. And Revelation 12 gives us insight. I want to read there. Starting in verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Here comes one of the greatest lines in all of Scripture. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Beloved, this is one of the most glorious stories. Some of you go, well, that, that doesn't sound like good news. <laughs> he was cast out of the second heavens to the earth. <laughs> we, we would quite kindly like to keep him there. <laughs> Wouldn't we? Well, actually, no. If you've done any study of military strategy, you know this. Whoever has the high ground wins the war. And right now, Satan has been allowed. God has allowed him to set up his kingdom in that second heavens. And from that high vantage point of the second heavens, he sets up his castles, his fortresses, and systems of darkness in the nations of the earth. From that high ground of spiritual authority in the second heavens, for the Bible calls him the ruler of this age, the God of this age, the ruler or the prince of the power of the air. That in that second heavens regions, he has spiritual hosts of darkness, hosts of wickedness, principalities and powers but there's good news tonight that when Jesus rose from the dead he ascended right through the second heavens as a man right through the second heavens and took his seat at the right hand of God the Father Almighty and now he has all the power and authority in heaven and earth And Revelation 12 tells us of this transition, this mighty war that's going to break out. 
when the second heavens are cleansed and Satan himself loses the high ground. You see, God is going to make all things new. And the second heavens, Michael and the angels are going to cleanse the second heavens. Oh, beloved, what will it be like on that day when the second heavens are cleansed and there's a global open heavens for all the saints? What will it be like when powers and principalities are dislodged and everything is an open heaven? All your prayers go up straight. (laughs) Oh, you want to be here on that day? And Satan loses the high ground. Michael and the host of heaven cleanse the second heavens. But there's one more realm to cleanse. And the Bible tells us the heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's. But the earth he has given to the children of men. Beloved, Michael cleanses with his angelic host. He cleanses the second heavens. And Satan and his minions are cast to the earth. The heavens is the Lord's, but the earth he's given to men. And the Lord tells us in Romans 16 verse 20 that the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. Whose feet? Your feet. Beloved, you have a role to play. I have good news for you tonight. The moment you were born, you were born into an epic war. Here's the good news. You were born for war. You were made for the conflict. Now, ladies, don't give me that look like, well, I'm just not. No, you have it in you. I remember one time when my wife and I walked somewhere and someone said something rude to her. She looked at me like, you better hit that guy. You better hit him. I'm not allowed to, but you can. There's something in every human being that was made for war. Why? Because God, from the very beginning, put enmity between the woman and the serpent. There's something in you that despises the fact that some wicked spiritual host of darkness has set up his kingdom and oppressed our race for 6,000 years. And the angels cleanse the second heavens and cast him to the earth. And you would imagine at this point, as the devils cast to the earth, you would imagine a sound coming up from the earth like, Like the damsel in distress, you know, like, save me, Rapunzel, something. I don't even know that story. (laughs) You you would imagine you'd hear screams as, but that's not the case. Why? We signed up for victory. We didn't sign up for the second heavens to be cleansed and the earth to remain stained by sin and guilt and demonic oppression. The blood of Jesus has laid the foundation for the removal of sin, the resurrection for the conquest of death. But beloved, in the second coming, the destruction of demonic forces. Oh my. Look at what happens as Satan is cast to the earth. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Beware! Run for cover! Watch out! No, it's not that. Listen to the commentary. As soon as Satan is thrown from heaven, look what it says. Then I heard a loud loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation. Now strength. Now the kingdom of our God 
and the power of his Christ have come. Look at such confidence from heaven. He says, I prepared my bride. Haven't you read the scriptures, Ephesians 4, 13? That the church will come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. They will grow up into a perfect man. They will go up into the head, Christ Jesus. Have you not read Revelation 19, what it says? Hallelujah! For the wedding of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. She's dressed in white, the righteous deeds of the saint. Have you not read Revelation twenty two seventeen 17, that at the coming of the Lord, the church will be in unity with the Holy Spirit, saying, Come, Lord Jesus. And the voice from heaven says, What began in that garden, round two begins. Just as the serpent was allowed to manifest his power and might in that garden through deception. The first time he won, the second time, now power, now salvation, now dominion, now the kingdom. It's a different story. For that bride has been washed in the blood of the Lamb. She's a kingdom of priests before her God. She's connected to the vine. She's fruitful. She's walking in her authority and her identity as a cherished, relished bride of Christ. Filled with love. Walking in humility. And the voice from heaven comes. Now salvation. Now strength. Now the kingdom of our God. Now the power of his Christ as round two comes. And the bride's up for this test. As a matter of fact, she's going to overcome the accuser of the brethren. She's not going to fall to his devices. She's going to be prepared. The Holy Spirit has done his job. He's made the church ready. The Holy Spirit under the leadership of Jesus is going to prepare the church and the church is going to walk in victory. And in those last three and a half years, the church will shine the brightest. Oh, beloved, I I don't want to be gone on those days. I want to be here for the final thrust, the last battle. When God pours out his spirit with a global open heaven and the bride dressed in the righteous deeds of the saints and she knows who she is, she knows who she's loved by. And she's picked up her sword of the spirit and she's armed to a T. And she knows why she was redeemed. To participate with the Lord of glory in the great story of redemption. Look what it says. For the accuser of the brethren who has accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. He's lost the high ground. (laughs) He's relegated to the sphere of the earth. The Bible tells us that he's going to put all of his chips in one basket. One demonized ruler who will bring forth Rulership on the earth for a limited time and bring the worst oppression human history has ever seen. But there's good news. God has left a witness and he's left a church who's filled with his spirit, walking in his power. And in verse 11, look what it says. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Hallelujah. By the word of their testimony... And they did not love their lives to the death. And they overcame him. 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 him. I'm here to declare to you tonight. You don't have to live in the bondage of sin and Satan. I'm here to declare to you tonight 
they overcame him. I'm here to declare to you, the church is not going to be in bondage to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life on that day. Why? They overcame him. They overcame him. The good news is this. You're a preview of that glorious day. You can overcome him tonight. You can overcome him. The same way that corporate bride overcomes him in those last days by the blood of the Lamb, the word of your testimony, and you can love your life not so much as to shrink back from death. It's good news tonight. But they overcame him. See, you were born for war. More than the war on terror and more than the overcoming of an economic shaking, you were born into God's kingdom to partner with Christ in destroying the works of the evil one. I hope you're more happy than that. You were made to invade, to conquer, to take back in every sphere to bring God's kingdom. Revelation 12 verses 10 and 11 describes the type of church who will prevail over the evil one. Now here's something we need to know and this is what's pertinent for our time here tonight. Because we know that Revelation 12, 7 is going to signify a transition in human history. That there's going to be a war in heaven where Michael cast and his angels cast down the devil and his demons. We know on that day the bride is going to be prepared. Walking in white. Walking in her identity. Walking in the greater works than these of Jesus Christ. Salvation, healing, and deliverance flowing from her. It'll be a day of great fruit. An hour of great fruitfulness. Global open heaven. Spirit-filled church. A glorious day. As John 17, 21 says, on that day, there'll be a unity of the faith. And as the Father and the Son are one, so we too shall be one that the whole world might know that God the Father sent Jesus Christ, His Son. It's coming. But what most people don't know is the event that triggers this event. You see, there's a role that you and I and the nations are playing right now. It's playing out on a global scale right now because this event event doesn't happen in isolation there's a trigger event for Michael to stand and to cleanse the second heavens that begins to inaugurate the cleansing of the earth there's an event that takes place there's a trigger event in Revelation turn with me to Revelation chapter 5 A global prayer and worship movement is going to come forth that's going to initiate this very event. Much like Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 10, do you remember when Daniel was crying out for the destiny of Jerusalem? When he began to lift his voice and cry out and he was fasting and praying for 21 days and it says in that that the Lord released his angel to answer the prayer and to release revelation, end-time revelation. But as that angel went out, the Bible tells us that a demonic principality, the prince of Persia, moved to stop that angelic envoy. But Daniel kept praying. And his prayers, as he kept praying, released the archangel Michael. An angel, archangel Michael, came and broke through the prince of Persia, and that angelic message was delivered to Daniel. Beloved, what happened in Daniel's day on that limited scale, the Bible tells us, is going to happen on a cosmic scale. 
The church is going to enter into a global expression of prayer and worship. And when she does, it will release the greatest move of justice that will begin in the heavens and will be walked out on the earth. Last year at this gathering, I spoke to you about the night and day prayer, night and day prayer and worship movement because Christ is worthy to receive worship night and day. In fact, he's worthy more than night and day worship. He's worthy more than 24-7 worship. He's worth 25, 8, 365, and everything and more that we can give him. He's worth that. If we just did prayer and worship out of love to gaze upon him because he's worthy, that would be enough, but that's not all there is. Because the Christian life is not just a life about just gazing You were born into an epic war and there's a battle to be fought. The good news is you can gaze upon the beautiful one as you inquire in the temple and you get about your military orders. There's a kingdom to be brought. There's a king to be worshipped and there's a kingdom to be brought. And God's answer for both is night and day prayer and worship. In Revelation 4, We're given the picture of the Holy One on His throne, the Creator God. And in Revelation 4, 8, the living creatures are crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And as that proclamation is given, the 24 elders throw their crowns down and they say, Yes, He is holy. And they worship the Creator. And then in Revelation 5, it gives us the drama of the Son of Man, Jesus Himself, the Lamb of God, who is going to approach the Father of glory and take the scroll from the right hand of the Father of glory. And in Revelation 5, there's a cry that goes out Who is worthy? To take the scroll and to loose its seals. Who's worthy to execute the Father's plan to drive off darkness from the planet and to bring forth a kingdom of love? Who's worthy of such a task, such a monumental task as to destroy the works of the devil with all finality, with all effectiveness, with all wisdom? Who is up for task? Who could pull this off? In verse 3, no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah He has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seven seals. He says, don't weep. (laughs) Have you seen your king? That one from chapter one, that glorious king, that one whom you laid your head against, John, that one whom you saw crucified, that slain lamb, he's worthy not only to die for the forgiveness of sins, as glorious as that is, but beloved, There's more to it than that. You're forgiven, and now you're enlisted (laughs) so that you can bring his kingdom in every sphere, in every nation, till the earth is filled with the knowledge of the glory of God like the waters cover the sea. And look what happens. And looked and behold, and in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now beloved, at this point, we see the Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, God in the flesh. Son of God, Son of Man, Jesus of Nazareth, born of a woman, but came from heaven. 
He walks up to the right hand of the Father of glory and he takes that scroll from the Father's hand. And the Bible tells us that he has all wisdom. He has seven eyes which represent perfect knowledge, perfect wisdom to execute the plan. He also has seven horns, which means it symbolizes there his perfect power. He has all strength. Not only does he have perfect wisdom and perfect strength, but he has the sevenfold spirit of God. He has all of heaven's resources. Now, if you had perfect wisdom, perfect power, and unending resources, do you think you're ready to execute the Father's plan? Yeah, that's a, that's a good uh, uh, list of conditions or whatever you want to call them. But he waits. Before he opens that scroll and looses its seals, before he does the Father's will, he waits for one more thing. You see, God has longed for partnership with his people. God has longed for partnership. You have a role to play. Hear me in this. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to quicken our spirits right now. Because you have a role to play. You have an important part. You were born into something of epic proportions in which the God who loves you dearly wants you to partner with Him so He can bring forth full redemption. Perfect power, perfect wisdom, perfect resource. But he's waiting on something. Let's look in verse 8. What is he waiting on? What could he possibly want? Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders found, fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. What's he waiting on? As the living creatures and the elders bow down and they offer, they go, here's what he's been waiting on. And they offer him golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Harps and bowls, bowls of prayer and harps, the worship, the twofold movement of the heart, which is to behold the beauty of the Lord and then to inquire in His temple. God, release your power. Awesome God, release your power. Oh, you're glorious. Set all your children free. And they offer the the harps. Oh, there's none like you. And then they offer the bowls. Make all things new. Save our families. Save our nations. As all the prayers of all the saints for every tribe, tongue, and nation begin to arise. Save my nation. Save my city. Save my tribe. Save my race. Save my ethnic group. Save my people. God, deliver us. Deliver us. And the cries of the saints begin to emerge from all the nations of the earth. And as they reach with love to God and as they cry out for justice, Jesus looks down. And as they begin to sing a new song, Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb to take the scroll and opens its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Here is the, hear this. Out of every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation. So here you have every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Every tribe and tongue. Every nation. Every people group. Standing before God. A remnant from every nation. Saying, God, you're worthy. Send Jesus. Make all things right. Sin justice. And as Luke 18, 7 and 8 says, to those who cry out night and day, will he not send speedy justice? Yes, I tell you, he will. 
but will the Son of Man find faith on the earth when He comes? Will we believe that God's method of releasing His power in the realm of human affairs is prayer? Will we believe that when His saints cry out to Him night and day, God will send justice? He will begin to execute His plan, but He's waiting. He's waiting. Isaiah tells us this, that he wants to release his power, but he's waiting till we cry out. Beloved, all over the earth right now, God is raising up prayer. If I could tell you of all the stories of all the nations, God is doing it everywhere. He's releasing the revelation of the beauty of his son, and the earth is falling in love with Jesus again. And as he reveals that revelation, people don't want to stop worshiping. I don't want to stop. I don't want your Sunday morning for two hours. I want Jesus worship all day, every day. Why? Because I've been stung like my 17-year-old and 15-year-old have been stung that he's worthy. And all over the earth, just as it is in heaven, they worship him night and day. So shall it be on the earth. And all over the nations are beginning to worship the Lord. And the glorious songs of the Lamb are rising from every continent and every nation. Oh, 20-year-olds write me all the time from all the nations of the earth. We're doing it. We've got the vision of the glory of Jesus. But do you know that Jesus who's glorious has an agenda? That Jesus who's glorious has a love affair with human beings. And that glorious Jesus has a pure, raw hatred of all demonic kingdoms. He has no mercy for the evil one. There's no redemption for Satan and all of his cohorts. He's coming back one day on a white horse with all the saints. And he's going to vanquish every demonic power in principality. He's going to do it. Why? Behold, I have the keys of death and hell. The lion of the tribe of Judah, he has prevailed. Beloved, we're getting a revelation of his glory, a revelation of his word to be worshipped, but that's not all we're getting. We're waking up to a war. We're waking up that the bride is a warring bride. <laughs> that bride, she knows who she is. She's loved and cherished. And let me tell you something. Nothing's more terrifying than a bride who knows who she is. <laughs> Nothing. I'm telling you what, my little five foot three wife, when she knows who she is, my six foot three, 210 pound frame is chicken of her. When she gets that little look in her eyes and says, Alan Scott Hood, let me tell you something. This is the way it's going to be. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yo. <laughs> You're cute right now. <laughs> I like you like this. <laughs> oh, when we come into our identity as cherished and loved by Jesus, forgiven at the cross, Oh, when we receive the righteousness that was His righteousness becomes ours and we rest in the finished work of the cross. And when we fall in love with the revelation of who He is, the Bible tells us it does it in there. Why? Because we have a job to do. We're going to partner with Him for justice. And that when the bride begins to lift her voice in prayer night and day, that God will hear and He will send Speedy justice. Oh, beloved, right now it's happening. God is bringing forth people who love him, who will be like Mary of Bethany and sit at his feet and listen to him and lavish their love upon him. And those same ones will take up their sword and they will go to the nations and proclaim the gospel and lay down their lives for the kingdom and cast out devils and heal the sick and preach the gospel to the poor and they will intercede on behalf of the least and the lost and the unreached and they will cry out till every tribe, tongue, and nation 
has a witness to Jesus and his saving mercy. And the Lord is enlisting people right now in every nation. In fact, God is speaking to some of you like he spoke to my son. On May 7, 2012, on the 13th year anniversary, my son snuck up into Mike Bickle's office. He snuck up into his office and he said, if I'm going to write a 10-page paper on the night and day prayer movement, I'm going to do it in Mike's office. Well, guess what? That's an anointed office. The Holy Spirit came upon him and commissioned him. Not through the words of a man or not because his father has desires of him to enter in the ministry. Heaven, the Lord himself, sent the spirit of revelation. His eyes were open and suddenly he was commissioned. I believe the Lord wants to commission us tonight. I believe he's enlisting us. You might not be able to do night and day prayer in your church. Or your ministry, but you can do it in your city. You can do it in your state. You know, in Virginia, they're getting together saying, hey, we can't pull it all off in just one place. Let's link together. You take the night. We'll take the day. We'll cover our state and see the power of God released. We'll see speedy justice in our state. There's nations here. You can't pull it off yourself right now 24-7, but you can as a nation You can as a language group. You can as a people. And God is bringing us together. And the whole earth is going to sing. Oh, the great day when Kansas City is not a unique place. When the whole earth incense is arising. And worship to the Lamb is ascending to the throne. And the saints are getting set in their identity as cherished and loved and forgiven and empowered. And now we're enlisted to do his good work. I've heard some people say, well, I'm a prayer and worship. I'm a prayer and worship movement guy. And I've heard some other people say, well, I'm a kingdom of God in all spheres guy. Oh, why in the world would you choose The great intercessor at the right hand of God, the eternal intercessor, is the great evangelist. He's the king of the kingdom. Let me ask you a question. If you had to choose between your heart and your liver, which one would you choose? If you had to choose between your brain and your lungs, which one would you choose? There's not a choice. There's not a prayer and worship movement camp and a kingdom of God now camp. There's a kingdom camp. It includes prayer, worship, glorifying God night and day, and it includes salvation, healing, deliverance, missions, outreach, power, explosions of God's anointing. Don't you choose. You get in the river. Don't you choose your little pond over on the side. You get in the river and let it sweep you off your feet. And you get before him in an attitude of adoration and love. And you weep before the God of Jesus who humbled, humbly came and loved us even unto death. And you just weep there for hours. Then you get an attitude for everybody else that you want to come into that same experience. And you pray and intercede. And then you preach and you heal and you deliver. The good news is this. It's coming to a city near you. Why? This one, this one phrase, they overcame. They overcame. They overcame. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit right now to release a fresh commissioning in our hearts. To bring us right into the center of God's will. That in every tribe and tongue and nation, God would raise up night and day extravagant worship. 
Actually, it's not extravagant. It's, it's only what's fitting to him. And that he would empower his church and set us in our right identity. That we might intercede for the salvation of all peoples. So just stand with me if you would. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to mark hearts. If I can have the worship team come up. So, Father, we thank you. In fact, there's good news for you tonight. You don't have to live underneath the oppression of that canceled sin. You know, the blood of Jesus not only cancels your sin, he breaks the power of canceled sin. He actually does more than just freeze you on paper. He actually frees you. He writes your name in the Lamb's book of life, but he also, by the Holy Spirit, can deliver you. Tonight, some of you have been wrestling underneath strongholds of oppression, depression, despair, perversion. The Lord has good news for you tonight. And they overcame. And they overcame. And they overcame. And they overcame. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. So, Father, here we are tonight. Set apart this room for your glory. A great deliverance. Shatter powers of darkness that have oppressed our minds, our wills, and emotions. Break the power of darkness off of our bodies. Loose your glittering spear and spear and your sharp sword. Father, tonight commission us, enlist us afresh. Oh, beloved, what a glorious hour to live in. The nations partnering to worship God night and day and to pray for His justice on the earth and to do His kingdom exploits. I wouldn't want to live in any other hour than this one. Well, I tell you, there is a transition happening right now. I don't know if it's today or last week or the last year, but in this season, there's a transition God is joining us together at a heart level and he's getting clarity about the whole counsel of God and we're going to begin to move forward in this thing to strategize and to labor just as Israel labored for the first coming of Christ oh beloved God's pouring out his spirit on the church and we're going to enter into a labor we're going to birth something in the place of prayer. We're going to birth something in the place of worship. And the nations of the earth, we're going to link arms and we're going to begin to do this thing till every tribe and tongue begins to worship Him and pray night and day. Till every people group has a church planted in it. The praying church is arising. The praying church is arising. Beloved, on that day, the only church that's going to be here is a praying, madly in love church with Jesus. The only church, a praying, effective, powerful church, thrust into the harvest, loving their lives, not even unto death. So Holy Spirit, release a commissioning from heaven tonight. Commission us. I ask for teenagers like my boys, God, commission teenagers tonight. God, I lift up leaders like myself who got stung by the revelation of God's glory, who wanted more than just the, the, uh, the, to lead a group of people. We wanted to be part of something 
a glorious story of the gospel in the nations. Lord, I ask you to release that commissioning, that piercing of the heart tonight. Release that ministry of fire upon the heart tonight. Release it, Lord, right now. Release it right now, God. That ministry of fire. Burn our hearts with revelation. Pierce us with those fiery eyes of love. Give us understanding. Lord, we ask for supernatural commissioning. Now, if you know tonight the Lord is marking your heart, as you wait before Him, you go, I I know God's marking my heart. In fact, as you were speaking, Allie, my heart was burning. I I I felt this desire that this is what I was made for, to come into love and to bring His kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. If that's you, I want to invite you. Come up to these lines or that second row of lines. Just come on up. I want to pray for you. Some of you, the Lord has been commissioning. You go, I'm a singer. I'm a worship leader. I'm a preacher. I'm an intercessor. I know that's my calling. I want God to mark me again and set me as a watchman on the wall. Touch us. Touch us tonight. Touch us tonight. Touch us tonight. Touch us. Some of you have been through the most difficult years, these last years. You struggle with things you've never ever struggled with and you've felt defeated and pushed down and the enemy's lied to you and said it's going to be this way forever. No, it's not. They overcame. They overcame. They overcame. Yes, it's been a war. Yes, it's been a war. Yes, it's been a battle. But you're going to overcome. God is going to release new grace to do the small things, the little things that give you power over canceled sin. Thank you, God, for the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Matt, lead us in some worship. Begin to dialogue with the Holy Spirit. Say, commission me tonight. I want to be marked for this. I want to be trained. I want to be thrust out. Whatever sphere the Lord's put me in. Oh, I want to give Him my love there. I want to worship God with all of my heart. And I want to do His kingdom exploits.
the Lord's going to begin to give many of you just his heart for neighborhoods, schools, college campuses, cities, perhaps even nations, your nation or other nations of the earth. So, Father, we ask for a holy commissioning. Lord, release encounters upon our hearts. Lord, give us commissionings, Lord, for the nations, for neighborhoods, for schools, for colleges. Begin to release the spirit of prayer across this nation and the nations of the earth. Begin to awaken an army of lovesick worshipers with the spirit of prayer. So do it now, Lord. Here we are. Commission us. Commission us. I just felt impressed that many of you have asked the Lord, could I, could I learn to lead somebody to Jesus? And the Lord says, yes, I want to teach you. Ask him, say, this year, God, give me an opportunity to be a witness. Whether they say yes or not, I, I want to do that. I want to begin to step out. I want to fall in love worshiping you. And I want to get effective with the word of God in my hand and in my mouth. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, release that divine commissioning for the kingdom. For worship and prayer and for ministry, healing salvation, deliverance. Release it, Lord. Commissioning now. Release it. By the Holy Spirit, touch us. Touch us. Give us dreams. Speak to us. Lay hold of us with burdens and yearnings for people groups, for nations, for cities, for schools, for campuses, for our family. Do your good work. Do your good work. In Jesus' name. Now talk to the Lord. Say, Lord, do it in me. Beloved, I was 20-some years of age when I came to the first conference where Mike was leading it, and I answered an altar call like this one, and I actually believed in that altar call. If I talked to God, He was going to hear me. And, beloved, He heard. He really hears little prayers, little reaches of your heart. He says, I remember the, la the love of your youth when you went after me just talk to him right now these prayers count large before God it's not just a regular altar time it's real you before a real God who loves you intensely and has a plan for your life God release those commissionings now answer those prayers touch us in Jesus name Spirit. 